This video is for the exam question, discuss two or more neural mechanisms involved in controlling eating behaviour. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint that accompanies this video with the full notes sections, so it has, each note section has a, the paragraphs that you would need for the model essay. Um, if you think that would be helpful to have while you're watching the video, then you can tweet me at blonde underscore pretzel and request one. So the neural mechanisms essay um, leans very heavily onto the nature side of the nature nurture debate that we always have in psychology. The neural mechanisms theory of eating behaviour is a biological explanation. So it identifies that it's the brain that, was just, that is responsible for why we feel hungry, why we feel full, and why we desire certain foods. Um, there are many neural mechanisms involved in controlling eating behaviour and we can't look at all of them. So this video will just provide you with the material for the full 24 mark essay that might come up in the exam. So the things that we're going to concentrate on today are the role of homeostatic mechanisms in regulating our food intake, the role of the lateral hypothalamus in switching on eating behaviour, the role of the ventromedial hypothalamus in switching off eating behaviour, and the role of the amygdala in our food choices, so what we actually desire to eat. And before we go any further, I just want to recommend these two textbooks, which are outstanding for any A-level psychology student. Um, they're called the Complete Companion books by Mike Cardwell and Cara Flanagan. And the exam companion in particular is very useful at this time of year because it has lots of model essays and structures of essays which could help you. So uh, we're going to start with the role of homeostatic mechanisms in regulating food intake. And homeostasis is a biological process involving neural mechanisms to detect the internal environment of the body and also to work to restore levels to an optimal state. So homeostasis will find out what's going on inside your body and then it will work to get your body just functioning normally again. So for example, homeostasis is important in terms of um, body temperature. So if your body detects that you're too hot, then you're going to sweat, which will cool you down, and you'll be motivated to probably remove, remove clothing or go somewhere cooler. And likewise, if you were too cold, your body would detect that, homeostasis would detect that, and so you would start to shiver, which would warm your body up, and you would seek to put on extra clothing and, and warmth. So homeostasis is this biological process, and in terms of eating behaviour, the body has evolved two homeostatic mechanisms to regulate food intake, which are both dependent on glucose levels. So you can see here that a, a fall in glucose levels activates the lateral hypothalamus, resulting in feelings of hunger, and this causes the individual to search for and consume food. A rise in glucose levels activates the ventromedial hypothalamus, leading to feelings of satiation, which means being full, like feeling full up and the person stops eating. So next we're going to look at the role of the lateral hypothalamus in switching on eating behaviour. And The hypothalamus is an area in the forebrain and in the 1950s researchers discovered that injury and stimulation to the lateral hypothalamus in rats caused distinct eating behaviours. So damage to the lateral hypothalamus caused aphasia and aphasia means to stop eating and stimulation to the lateral hypothalamus caused hyperphagia. Hyperphagia means overeating. And so if you think about it, the, um, if the lateral hypothalamus is the on switch for eating, but it gets damaged, you're trying to switch it on, but it's been damaged, so therefore you can't turn it on, and that's why it caused aphasia in rats. Whereas if you um, had a, an on switch for eating and you stimulated it, so you just kept your finger on it, constantly, then that's going to cause overeating, uh, which we call hyperphagia. And that's what they found that happened to the rats in that research in the 1950s. So researchers concluded that the lateral hypothalamus was the on switch for eating behaviour. Um, a neurotransmitter called neuropeptide Y, or that can be abbreviated to NPY after you've written it once, was found to be particularly important in switching on eating. So Wickens in 2000 found that when NPY was injected into the hypothalamus of rats, it immediately caused them to feed, even when satiated, which means being full up. And Stanley et al. 1986 found that repeated injections of NPY into the hypothalamus of rats caused obesity in just a few days. So you can see this picture here of poor old, this poor rat, which is obese, 
Um, and the, I use a memory peg just to say, like, Stanley, the big fat rat, um, and imagine the syringe with the neuropeptide Y going into him. So take a good look at that picture again. Imagine the syringe going into him and just give him a name. He's called Stanley the Fat Rat. And the reason he's so fat, he's had NPY injected into his hypothalamus, so he's feeding, he's got hypophagia, and he's become obese in just a few days. Next, we're gonna look at the role of the ventromedial hypothalamus in switching off eating. So that means, how do we know when we're full up? Because food is just delicious, isn't it? Like, you think about your favorite food and you just wanna eat it, but, you, when you're eating your favourite food, you get to the point where you just can't eat another bite. And the reason being is, is that glucose levels will rise, and so the ventromedial hypothalamus is um, activated to switch off eating behaviour, and it makes you feel full, and you literally can't eat any more. Um, this picture here shows Adam Richman, who is famous for, um, with all things to do with food, but he did a programme called Man vs Food, which you may have seen. Um, where he did lots of eating challenges. And so um, I'll put a, I've put a link in the description for this one, just it's a three minute video, where you can see him trying to eat a burrito. And it's massive, it's six pounds of food, like in weight. Um, and he's got to eat it in 90 minutes. So he starts off and he absolutely like canes it. He gets, he gets like two thirds of the way through quite quickly. And then he just hits a wall. And you, if you watch it, you can see him, he's sweating, He's in pain, he's actually in pain. And it's not about the stomach being full, it's about that ventromedial hypothalamus being activated. And so he's trying to fight his brain. Um, and his brain is going, no, no more, no food, you can't put any more food in. And, and quite often, if you look at all the man versus food challenges, quite often food will win. Because our body, um, this neural mechanism, to stop us eating is so strong that we just can't eat any more, we can't put any more in. So the satiety signals originate in our stomach as it, becomes as it becomes distended from eating and are sent from the cells involved in digestion. And this message is sent to the hypothalamus. So the ventromedial hypothalamus releases anorexigenic peptides, which are appetite suppressants, and so eating stops. So in the 1950s, again, the, the researchers discovered that injury and stimulation to the ventromedial hypothalamus in rats caused distinct eating behaviours. So damage to the VMH caused hyperphagia and stimulation to the VMH caused aphasia. So researchers concluded that the ventromedial hypothalamus was the off switch for eating behaviour and the ventromedial hypothalamus was designated the satiety centre. So the, it's, the VMH is the satiety center, like the being full up. It's the actual bit of your brain that they decided was the part of the brain that would determine when you were full. So the last part of the AO1 material is the neural control of cognitive factors. And you will know that if you hear the word cognitive, you're thinking about thoughts, how you process your thoughts. And so if you, the, the role of cognitive factors in eating is about how you process your thoughts to make your food choices. If you think about your favourite fruit food right now, really think about it and picture it and think about the last time you ate it, chances are it's going to make your mouth water and you're going to feel hungry. So cognitive aspects of food include memories, images and food related sights and smells. So imagine like thinking past an Indian restaurant. If you, I'm, I'm thinking about that now, I can picture it, I can see it and the smell that comes, you're just saying I want to get in there and, and eat all that wonderful food. So um, cognitive factors are actually quite powerful in your mind, your memories of food, you can, the sights and the smells. So we can see that cognitive factors are important in our choices of food and the particular part of the brain called the amygdala um, is also responsible, for, well particularly responsible for controlling what you eat according to this theory. So the amygdala is responsible um, also for episodic memory, which you will know from your AS means uh, the part of your memory that remembers episodes in your event, like past events. And the amygdala will um, allow you to remember episodes, but it also, you remember the emotion connected with that episode as well, which could be negative or positive. Um, so for example, you might remember going to college last week and the emotion connected with it, you may have felt elated if you got an A grade, um, or um, 
imagine if your teacher made you look stupid in front of the whole of the class hopefully that would never happen but if they did every time you remembered that episode you would feel the same anger and frustration at that teacher and probably the subject and it might even taint your whole experience of college forever um, and so the, the amygdala is responsible for that kind of episodic memory and the emotions attached which are very personal to each individual so with regards to eating behavior the amygdala you when you remember eating the emotions of, like connected with eating are also um, uh, connected to to that as well so for example you and your family might have a kind of ritual where you make something delicious on a friday night and eat together um, maybe like chicken fajitas or, or something like that or veggie ones if you're vegetarian um, and so whenever you you know like say so fajitas kind of have a strong connection in your brain and so they're going to be something they're going to be a food that you that you choose to 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 eat in your life um, and you also might extend that to just like all spicy foods or all Mexican foods. So the role of the amygdala in eating behavior is thought to be primarily in the selection of foods on the basis of previous experience. And the researchers we need to know are Rolls and Rolls, 1973, and yes, those are their real names. And they found that surgically removing the amygdala in rats would cause the animals to consume both familiar and novel foods. But rats that did not have their amygdala removed would initially avoid novel foods and only consume the familiar foods. So I don't have any rats, but I have got a couple of guinea pigs that I can use. They're not actually my guinea pigs, so thank you Jake and Billy for letting me use your guinea pigs. And the types of foods that the guinea pigs usually eat are these. So you've got carrot and cabbage. But today we're going to try them on a novel food, which is green pepper. And according to Rolls and Rolls, they should avoid the novel foods, green pepper, and just go for the cabbage and the carrot because they've got their amygdala intact. So let's go and see what, what happens. So one's eating a carrot and the other's eating the cabbage. Neither have gone for the pepper. Should we move one a bit closer? Oh. Right, so he's eating it, and he's loving it. <laughs> so much for rolls and rolls. <laughs> Maybe his amygdala's not intact. A good memory peg for rolls and rolls is if you imagine um, two rolls that have got an amygdala in it, so it's like an amygdala sandwich, and you think, I don't wanna, I don't wanna eat that. Um, but then some rats come along and just devour the whole thing. And so the idea being that it's rolls and rolls of the researchers. They said that the amygdala is responsible for your selection of foods based on previous experience. And the rats who have their amygdala removed will eat basically anything, even an amygdala sandwich. So that's the way that I remember rolls and rolls. So now we're going to look at the evaluation or the AO2 material. So the first point is uh, the limitation of the homeostatic explanation in controlling eating. So if you look at this picture here, you can see Lucy, which uh, is a reconstruction of Australopithecus. So um, Lucy was around basically in the environment of the evolutionary adaptation, so the EEA, and you all know that means like basically caveman times. It means where we, like the harsh environment where we evolved. And and so this is a criticism of the homeostatic explanation for eating because in the EEA, the conditions would have been so harsh that um, you couldn't just depend on rise and fall in glucose levels to determine when you were going to eat because otherwise you'd have starved to death. So for homeostasis to be truly adaptive, then we must anticipate hunger and not just react to the rise and fall in our glucose levels. So the homeostatic explanation doesn't take into account the psychological need to plan ahead for food. And it's not just in the EEA that this would have happened. If you think about people today who might be in financial hardship, they're not gonna wait for their rise and fall in glucose levels for them to plan their next meal. They might, if they were in severe hardship, they might be planning a trip to a food bank. Um, here's one today. Because they need to plan ahead to feed themselves and their families. So this is a criticism of the homeostatic explanation because it's not taking into account the psychological need to plan for food in the future. 
An evolutionary criticism of the homeostatic explanation is that um, the evolutionary psychologists, um, they offer an alternative explanation and they think the primary influence for hunger and eating is food's positive incentive value and think that people have evolved to eat foods that would have aided their survival in the EEA. And so if you look at a picture of this chimp, uh, he's just sitting there looking happy, but um, there was someone called Stanford in 1999 who was studying chimps in a Tanzania national park and the chimps, it was a very harsh environment and they were almost half starved and when they finally made a kill of a colobus monkey instead of going for the tender nutritious flesh which would have been easy to get to they went straight for the brain and the bone marrow which involved using tools to get the bone marrow because that was the fattiest part and and so this is a kind of research, although it's not on humans, it's an evolutionary explanation to say that today we select fatty foods because we evolved to need them in the EEA. So that also is a criticism of the homeostatic explanation. It's not a rise and fall in glucose levels, it's that our food choices and our preferences today are based on what happened to our ancestors in the EEA. The next <coughs> point is on the lateral hypothalamus, the evaluation point, is the lateral hypothalamus the on-switch for eating? And some research by Sir Curie et al. 1998 found that damage to the lateral hypothalamus caused deficits in other aspects of behaviour such as thirst and sex rather than just hunger. And more recent research has shown that eating behaviour is controlled by neural circuits that run throughout the brain and not just by the hypothalamus. So Sakurai is saying if you damage, like they, the researchers labelled the lateral hypothalamus as the, um, the hunger centre, but if when you damage it, it also damages other areas like for thirst and sex, then maybe it's not just the hunger centre is, is what he's saying. So a memory peg for Sakurai et al, it's a bit of a long one but it works, um, imagine someone um, who's in a, a karate outfit and they've got the initials LH on their lapel for lateral hypothalamus. And somebody comes and karate kicks them in the head, which really hurts, and has damaged their lateral hypothalamus. So they fall to the ground on their hands and knees. They're really hungry, but the person who karate kicked them to the head is really horrible and is like kicking all the food away. So they can't get any food, they've got aphasia. But not only that, they're really, really thirsty and they can't get any, um, they can't get anything to drink, like the person's kicking all the drinks away from them as well. But luckily it starts to rain, so they think, oh, I'll just try and get a bit of the, a few of those raindrops. But um, Rihanna comes along with her umbrella, puts the umbrella over him, and he, he can't get any, any raindrops, so he can't get any, like, thirst-quenching stuff at all. And even when he looks at Rihanna, even though she's so beautiful, he doesn't even fancy her because he's got deficits in thirst and sex as well. So Sakura et al. said that if you damage the lateral hypothalamus, it causes deficits in thirst and sex, and so we, it questions whether it really is the hunger centre. Our next evaluation point is is neuropeptide Y's normal function to uh, influence feeding behaviour? So remember Stanley the big fat rat and he was injected in his brain with neuropeptide Y and it made him obese. And so they concluded that neuropeptide Y was really important. But Marie et al in 2005 genetically manipulated mice that they did not produce any or make any NPY. So you would expect if they've got no NPY there's going to be no feeding behaviour but that wasn't what they found. They found no decrease in their feeding behaviour. They suggested that obesity found in Stanley et al's experiment was actually an experimental artefact and that means um, that the repeated injections actually caused a behaviour that wouldn't normally occur. So an artefact is something that's man-made, so the experiment they did actually made that result rather than um, looking at neuropeptide-wise normal influence. So if Marie et al found that genetically manipulated mice without NPY fed normally, then it questions whether NPY is influential in switching eating on. Next we're going to evaluate the, the ventromedial hypothalamus. So is the ventromedial hypothalamus the off switch for eating? What about something called the paraventricular nucleus, um, which you can call a PVN? 
So early research has found that damage to the VMH resulted in hyperphagia and obesity. Therefore, the VMH was designated the satiety center. However, Gold, in 1973, disputed this and said damage to the VMH alone did not result in hyperphagia. Gold believed that damage to the paraventricular nucleus caused hyperphagia, which questioned the role of the VMH in switching off eating behavior. However, further research has failed to replicate Gold's findings. The next evaluation point is about whether hunger and satiety are fully under neural control. And hunger and stress might not be. Um, Lutter et al. in 2008 has shown that the body produces extra quantities of the hormone ghrelin in response to stress. And it's just part of the body's natural defense against stress because it reduces depressive and anxious behaviors. But ghrelin also boosts appetite, which explains comfort eating. And this finding suggests that blocking the body's response to ghrelin may help people with a tendency to comfort eat, to control their weight. And this questions the role of the ventromedial hypothalamus as being the satiety center, because stress and hormones associated with it could also affect hunger and eating behavior. So the last thing we're gonna do is uh, evaluate about the amygdala. Um, and there's a real world application for that because uh, damage to the amygdala could explain something called Kluver-Busey syndrome. So Kluver-Busey syndrome is a very strange psychological condition that affects people in many ways. They don't recognize people. Um, they become very inappropriate and sometimes in sexual ways. So they might, for example, take their clothes off in the middle of a supermarket. Um, but also it affects their eating behavior because they don't understand the natural food cues, the normal food cues. And so they will eat absolutely anything and everything, uh, including non-edible objects. So they might even try and eat an aeroplane. So that is a, a real world application. A major problem with the biological explanation of controlling eating is that it's reductionist. So what other factors are there that influence why we eat things and when we eat things. Because if it was under purely neural control, then we wouldn't have things like obesity or anorexia and we would, um, you know, we, we'd never try any new foods. So if you see this picture, this is actually a chimp's brain, but imagine it's a human's brain. It's like putting the brain in a jar for examination. We can see it, but it's not the full story. So who is the person that owns this brain? Where have they traveled? What have they experienced? How have their experienced their experiences shaped their eating behavior. And a good example of this um, is there's something called the, acculture the acculturation effect by Ball and Kennedy. So Ball and Kennedy studied uh, 14, over 14,000 women in Australia and that found that for all ethnic groups, the longer time they spent in Australia, the more they reported attitudes to food and eating habits, similar to women born in Australia. So but the long, basically, the longer you live in a country, the more you're going to actually take on their eating habits. And I could have been part of that experiment that, or that study that Ball and Kennedy did, because I lived in Australia in 2002. And when I first got there, there was um, a, a fast food chain called the Sushi King. And I thought, oh, why would anybody eat raw fish? And I just couldn't get my head around it. I thought it was absolutely disgusting. I thought it was really strange. By the time I left Australia, I just could not get enough raw fish. It's amazing. So, so that example, Ball and Kennedy's study, is a good, is a good study to say, look, the, the biological explanation is reductionist. It's not taking into account all the other psychological factors and cultural factors which could actually influence what you eat and why. So that's the end of the teaching video and I'm going to put up a couple of slides which gives you a possible structure for the 24 mark essay. It is only a possible structure. Um, those books that I recommended earlier, they've got a different structure, slightly different. You can do whatever you like, um, but this is a possible one. And if I was you, I would just pause the video so that you can write down the, the structure. Um, and it's all color coded because if you watch the video again, you can see all the slides are color coded. Um, if you would like to have a copy of the PowerPoint that accompanies this video with the full notes sections, so in the notes are the kind of script for what I've been saying, but also uh, each paragraph that you would need for the full essay. So if you think that you would find that helpful, perhaps to watch this video again with the PowerPoint or just to take that notes information, then you can uh, tweet me 
at blonde underscore pretzel and request a PowerPoint. Just be specific about which one it is that you would like. So good luck with the essay. Uh, good luck with your exams too. Uh, the neural mechanisms essay hasn't come up for a long time in eating behaviour, so it's a high contender. You can never like guarantee what's going to come up, but if I was studying for this exam, I would make sure I pay particular attention to learning this essay because it is a high contender to come up. So um, yeah, any other questions, you can just tweet me. See those eyes, I see those lies you keep From me now I realize those truths you hide Yet still, it's never forgotten What you mean to me Can I hold on now, just wait and see If I stay It's all in me